Hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you to um, Jacqueline and Sarah and the other organizers. I've pre-recorded this talk because I'm going to be traveling on Friday the 8th. And because there was some uncertainty about whether I'll be able to make it on time to the session, we decided that I'd pre-record the talk and then hopefully be able to join the Q&A live. Um, so I'm Javi Carell <clears throat> from the University of Bristol, <clears throat> Department of Philosophy. And I'm going to uh, talk about um, vulnerabilization. And the first uh, thing I will need to do is see if I can share my screen and get the slides up. There we go. And if that works, we should be on our way. Good. So uh, the talk title is Vulnerabilized Individuals and Opaque Institutions. And this is a paper I co-authored with my long-standing collaborator, Ian Kidd from the University of Nottingham. So this is all our shared work. Um, we started thinking about vulnerabilization um, probably about six months ago or so, maybe a little bit longer. And um, it was a very natural move for us to go from illness to vulnerability. So the previous work um, I did was on phenomenology of illness, on illness experience. <clears throat> and then the shared work I did with Ian was on epistemic injustice in illness and healthcare. More recently, what we call the predicament of, uh, of patients. Um, <clears throat> and we are completely, um, we see this work on vulnerability as a complete continuation uh, of our early work on illness, certainly my work. So what we're going to do today is to try and talk about not just ill people, not just dis disabled people, but people we term more broadly as vulnerabilized. <clears throat> I'll explain why I use the term vulnerabilized as opposed to vulnerable in a minute. Um, the important thing to note, of course, is that this could be a very, very diverse group, much more diverse than that of uh, people who are ill, chronically ill, <clears throat> or people who are disabled. Um, and what we wanted to do was to um, talk about the ways in which people can be vulnerabilized, i.e. made vulnerable or made more vulnerable through their interactions with various uh, institutions. It could be healthcare, it could be the criminal justice system, it could be the educational system. <clears throat> so of course, what we're talking about here is institutions far beyond the healthcare institutions themselves that we talk about in our work on epistemic injustice. And of course, we're talking about a very diverse group of persons, much broader than just ill people. Uh, the point of this is not to say, well, this is something that applies to everyone, but to try and identify the particular characteristics that um, might cause institutions to make people who, who come usually seeking help from those institutions, um, make them more vulnerabilized. Now, we talk about opaque institutions. What do we mean by opaque? We mean institutions that are bureaucratic, complex, hierarchical, uh, maybe very jargon heavy. I mean, medicine and law are two very jargon uh, heavy types of institutions and, and domains. And what happens when these types of institutions um, come into contact with groups that are negatively stereotyped, for example, ill persons, for example, disabled persons, for example, persons with learning disabilities, um, what can happen is that uh, this can come together, the opaqueness of the institution, which I'll explain in the talk, will come together with the vulnerabilized, uh, already vulnerable individuals, and together form an obstruction, if you like, of the practical and epistemic agency of persons who are vulnerable, made vulnerable, and then can be further vulnerabilized by this contact with opaque institutions. So, we use as our template or our, as our paradigmatic case, the case of illness. We think illness has unique features. If you think about illness, it is something that affects the bodies and minds of persons very uh, systematically, very profoundly, alters, very often alters their everyday existence, very often limits what they can do, is very often trying for people's patience, uh, for people's um, desires and dreams that have to be reconfigured in light of the illness, 
And uh, all of this together can come to what we have termed the predicament of patients. Part of this predicament is epistemic, but a part of it is not. Part of it stems from uh, the features of the institutions of healthcare that, are, as I said, are bureaucratic, complex, hierarchical, jargon heavy, and so on. But part of it stems from the um, this struggle somebody has with their own body in the context of illness, a body that becomes obstructive, that becomes uh, objectified, that becomes a problem to be solved. So what happens in the case of illness is that people are made vulnerable through their symptoms, through the physiological processes that are damaging their bodies or their minds. Um, in the case of psychiatry, this could be biological processes that we don't know about yet, or even no biological processes, but we do want to include uh, mental disorder within the kind of domain of what we're talking about. And um, what happens is that patients are uh, imposed upon by illness, then again imposed upon by shortcomings of the institutions of healthcare, and thirdly also imposed on by the negative stereotypes that we often attribute to ill, and I would say also disabled people in various contexts. Um, so we also have, and I'll, I'll talk about this later, what Ian calls in his own work, the, the, the vices of pathophobia and how these vices are quite widely spread in, in society and can impact um, almost every interaction an ill or disabled person has with others. So illness is a paradigmatic case of the vulnerability I was describing, but of course that vulnerability is widely shared with other groups and persons. Now, let me say a little bit more about the kind of vulnerability we are talking about here. What are its features? When we think about illness, of course, we can say this is a universal feature of human bodies and human lives. So we're all um, vulnerable to a degree, and we share significant vulnerabilities stemming from the ways in which our bodies are made, as it were. So we're finite, we're mortal, we die, and that is a huge vulnerability we have to cope with as the kind of creatures who, as Heidegger says, are, to, are towards their death or are aware of that death and live with the understanding that that is the end point of their life. <clears throat> Our bodies are, of course, vulnerable to, to illness. They're vulnerable to injury, to trauma, both psychological and physical, um, to pain, um, to, to, to encountering all sorts of limitations and, um, and harms along the way. And of course, uh, we're also vulnerable emotionally, right? We invest in relationships, we love other people, we invest our time in projects um, like teaching philosophy. And often um, the fact that we're so invested in other people and projects uh, can also make us vulnerable in the sense that our projects and desires can be thwarted and frustrated, our um, love for other people can be unrequited and so on. So we think that it's true to say that vulnerability is a universal feature of human lives. Um, and there's another paper on the last slide, you can see a reference to it, I've recently written about this kind of universal vulnerability. But of course, uh, even though we all die at the end and we're all susceptible to illness, pain, and so on, um, some of us are more vulnerable than others, and some of us are made more vulnerable than others through particular conditions. It could be social, economic, legal, and political conditions that may, will make some persons more vulnerable than others, and therefore more subject to the vulnerabilizing effect of illness, disability, sexism, ageism, racism, ableism, and other forms of social injustice and discrimination. So I want to hold on to both of these claims. First, that vulnerability has a universal, universal nature. We are all vulnerable to a degree, and we, we share in the, the foundational human makeup, the way we are made, as it were. We share this vulnerability, so it's an important point of, of connection, and uh, unity, if you like. But there are also particular conditions, in particular social injustice, that make some persons more vulnerable than others. 
Um, so ill persons are more vulnerable because of their illness, disabled persons because of their disability and social attitudes towards it, women more vulnerable because of sexism, older people because of ageism, um, people who are not white for uh, racism, and so on. So it's important to note that the vulnerability is not equally distributed across society, if you like, or across individuals. Now, of course, this vulnerability is never elected. It is something that is forced upon us. We are made vulnerable. We are forced to become vulnerable or to be vulnerabilized by various social, economic, legal, and political conditions. And it's important for us to reflect on the fact that although we partake in this universal vulnerability I talked about earlier, <clears throat> the individual or idiosyncratic ways in which vulnerability is forced upon individuals can be very, very harmful, very intrusive, very damaging. Now, um, to say a few more things about the universal nature of vulnerability, um, one thing that Ian and I both noted in our separate work and, and also in our shared work is that illness and other types of, of trauma, of, uh, of adversity, can also uh, transform us, it also has what might even be called edifying powers. So what happens is that adversity demands of us a form of reflective coping. Uh, trauma can afford us post-traumatic growth. This is a term taken from the psychologist Jonathan Haidt. Um, and so when we become vulnerabilized, we also change as individuals. We're transformed by what happens to us. And um, that transformation, transformation can sometimes, in the right context, in the right um, way, uh, be a source of personal growth or edification not always and of course it's really important to note um this isn't sort of some some kind of recipe for edification saying oh become ill or undergo trauma and you will become a better person nor is it a, a call or a demand on people who do undergo uh, trauma or face adversity to become personally edified by their trauma this is not at all what i'm saying what i am saying is that becoming vulnerabilized isn't necessarily a monolithically negative event, one in which only bad things happen to us, but that we should also notice, note, and try and um, indeed uh, 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 give an account of the positive effects that can sometimes happen when we reflectively cope with adversity. Now, um, I'll, I'll, I want to say one more thing about um, what we mean by the term a fact of life. So, vulnerability is shared and it's a fact of life. So Ian and I take fact of life uh, to be the fact that we are vulnerable, we are dependent on others, we are profoundly intersubjective, um, so, and, and we are open and vulnerable to affliction and damage and harm, both physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, and so on. So um, that being, a, a particular world picture that we want to suggest is really important because again it will give us um if you like a a, a worldview or a fundamental picture of human life as containing this fact of life this vulnerability and susceptibility to affliction as simply the way we are so um to summarize the, this first line, vulnerability is both shared as a very fundamental, very profound, deep feature of human existence, but it's also lived in highly specific ways by different people in different contexts. So how do people become vulnerable? So to paraphrase Simone de Beauvoir, one is not born vulnerable, but rather persons become vulnerable through the events that uh, happen to them, accident, trauma, injury, uh, becoming refugees, and so on, and the actions of others. And what I want to start and draw out here is the sense in which larger social institutions ought to be held accountable for the kind of vulnerabilization, uh, the kind of process of vulnerabilization that institutions can inflict on individuals. So again, I'm talking about health institutions, educational institutions, the criminal justice system, the social care system, um, a very, very broad array of institutions. And I want us to pay very close attention to how these institutions can implicitly or ex explicitly, deliberately or non-deliberately 
or entirely accidentally make people uh, vulnerabilized. Um, there's a great example that uh, I will just refer to briefly, a paper by Shelley Tremaine about uh, Canadian care homes during the pandemic. And uh, what Tremaine says is that what happened to people during the pandemic wasn't a sort of um, the people in, in, work, in care homes, the high death rates in care homes weren't some sort of accidental feature of the panic and the misunderstanding and the lack of knowledge and so on, but um, a systematic disadvantage that accrued to particular people, namely residents of care homes, um, in, in, in the case she talks about there in Canada, but this happened elsewhere, very high death rates um, due to the virus being brought into care homes, people being discharged from hospital back into care homes without a COVID test and so on. Uh, so I really recommend uh, Shelley's paper on, on the, which provides a really robust case study of the kind of vulnerabilization that I'm talking about here. So persons who are particularly prone or, uh, uh, to, to becoming vulnerable or more vulnerable, people with learning disabilities, with mental ill health, in general, people with disabilities, people who've had limited education, those who suffer domestic violence, people with neurodevelopmental disorders, the very old and the very young. So people who we would normally call vulnerable. Um, please note this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, you can add more and more to it. Um, but what I want to really strongly emphasize here is I think this heterogeneity doesn't damage the coherence of the concept of vulnerabilization. So what happens is that some features of a situation that are external to the individual cause them to be even more vulnerabilized or cause their vulnerability to become exacerbated. Um, now, of course, a very natural question would be to say, well, is anything really internal to us? I mean, obviously, um, all of these afflictions uh, that I pointed to uh, are, are the result of external features. Um, but what I want to really again emphasizes I'm looking at the process that makes vulnerable people even more vulnerable and this is not about um, the moral responsibility or culpability of those who are vulnerable so to say things like oh this person is in prison because they committed a crime yes of course that's that's true um, but what I want to ask is how do people uh, from particular social groups come to be overrepresented, for example, in the criminal justice system? What do we do about people with learning disabilities or with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder who come into this criminal justice system? How are they treated? Is there, are there deficits um, recognized and are they treated justly by the system or do they just get sort of chewed up and spat out the other end in a way that will make them more vulnerable? So, uh, Tremaine is very emphatic that uh, being vulnerable is not, as she says, a pre-discursive inherent human trait, but rather vulnerability is a contextually specific social phenomenon whose politically potent and artifactual character could be recognized and acknowledged if feminist philosophers, among others, were to take up Foucault's idea of eventalization. Now, what did um, Foucault mean by eventualization? He referred to the types of processes that are historical, contingent, um, and, and not necessary in any way that give rise to particular concepts or to particular uh, social constructs. Now, um, eventualization is a process by which somebody might become vulnerable, but Tremaine wants us to uh, really take on board that being vulnerable is not some sort of inherent human trait, but rather a social phenomenon uh, who has this, as she says, an artifactual character. So people become vulnerable because they live in a particular society, because they have particular social care arrangements, because they have access to this kind of education and not that kind of education. Um, so the important thing to, to take from, I'm taking from Tremaine is, is this idea that um, it is not some inherent essential trait of somebody. Somebody is not just vulnerable. They become vulnerable because of things that happen to them, and they could happen to them well before they're born. For example, as we see in a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, um, the fetus is harmed by alcohol uh, ingested by the by the mother during pregnancy. 
and this harm precedes their even their their coming into the world so how are vulnerabilities created we're talking about situational vulnerabilities that are caused or exacerbated by the personal social political economic or environmental situations of individuals or social groups including their interactions with institutions so again nothing here is is given nothing here is um, essential to the person or internal to the to the person sorry now here's a few examples so some people uh, for example, want to claim benefits, but they have difficulties processing information and applying it. So they're not able to fill in the correct forms in the correct way. Um, that difficulty of processing information might mean that they uh, don't do well in education, and but they don't necessarily get the support they need. Some people struggle to follow rules, for example, those with pathological demand avoidance. Um, I know this is a contentious diagnosis, but it, it's, it's quite a, um, a useful one to in order to take on board this idea that for some people entering an institution whilst having to follow rules is not an obvious, not an easy thing to do. Some have a limited ability to organize, plan, act effectively. So they're not able to, for example, attend appointments on time, medical or social care or educational appointments. Uh, some are unable to advocate for themselves, so they constantly need um, help from other people uh, and they're unable to explain to the institution they come into contact with what they need. Some are suspicious of institutions and are operatives. So some uh, people, some, some social groups are very suspicious of, for example, the police. Um, some could have a sensory processing disorder, which means that they can't tolerate uh, the fluorescent lighting or antiseptic smell of a waiting room. So for them, attending a hospital or a clinical appointment would be indeed very difficult. And some become distressed in unfamiliar places. Now, these are all examples that might seem very trivial, but without ample recognition and support, it means that these people are unable to access the very institutions that are meant to help them in education and health and social care and so on. And it might mean that they get categorized, for example, as obstructive as difficult patients as uh, people who aren't cooperating with their uh, their uh, social worker and so on now importantly um, the reliance of the, the types of people that i'm trying to describe here the reliance on institutions is often more pronounced amongst members of these groups or individuals with these characteristics and also more fraught so none of us want to come into contact with the social justice, sorry, the criminal justice system. Um, but some of us will rub against it over and over again due to personality disorder, conduct disorder, um, uh, growing up in, a, in an environment that was where, where, where a criminal behavior was acceptable and so on. So some of us will have a more pronounced reliance on institutions so people who are ill of course rely very heavily on their clinical care and on the support and caregiving that they need um, children who are in education of course have to be in education by law so they rely on the educational institution in a very profound way um, and similarly people who claim benefit rely on the social care system and so on now the problem is that this reliance the more pronounced it is, the deeper the reliance is, the more fraught the relationship is potentially, because the individual, the vulnerabilized individual, again, feels that they come up against these massive bureaucratic institutions, they have to read lots of instructions online, they have to fill in lots of forms, they have to explain over and over again what help they need. All of this is not easy for any of us, but it might be downright impossible for people who are already vulnerable in the ways that I was describing. So what happens when such people come into um, contact with institutions? They can become even more vulnerabilized. What does it mean to vulnerabilize someone? It means inter alia to impose, to exacerbate, to intensify, to prolong, exploit, or threaten a person who's already vulnerable and to make their existing vulnerabilities more har harmful so that the person's situation becomes worse. Now, 
Sometimes this is done deliberately through the vices I was talking about earlier, and I will give, give a few examples in, in a bit. Um, but sometimes it's just because of carelessness or miscommunication between or within an institution. The forms didn't arrive. Oh, I didn't get the email. Nobody responded because uh, nobody was sitting answering the phone on a particular morning. Um, uh, the teacher was off sick. The doctor is on compassionate leave. Um, so sometimes there could be institutions that are not very well run. And what happens when institutions are not very well run, that the first people who come to harm from that not very good running are people who are already vulnerable and become worse off as a result of the institution's shortcomings. This isn't to say that the shortcomings are deliberately there to harm these people, but it is to say that a badly run institution that is opaque in ways that I will describe in a minute will uh, or should be able to see that one of the consequences intended or not is going to be exactly this process of vulnerabilization so that some individuals who are already bad, badly off will become worse off as a result of interacting with an institution that is dysfunctional in some sense. Now, vulnerabilization can occur through careless institutional processes, miscommunication, as I said, or bureaucratic demands that make practical things like travel or obtaining documents nigh on impossible. So, uh, for example, I don't know if any of you tried to travel in the last few months. I've had to uh, travel a couple of times and I literally spent about a day making sure I understand the requirements I needed to complete in order to leave the UK, in order to enter another country, and then in reverse, in order to leave that country and come back into the UK. There were four sets of requirements uh, that kept changing all the time because of changes to the COVID policy and we're running across two countries at least. So, um, and you think, well, I was very lucky to be well educated and it took me the better part of a day trying to ascertain that. So you can see how bureaucratic demands of particular kinds can make something like travel just impossible for somebody who isn't able to comply with the requirements, the form filling, the PCR tests and so on. Now, <laughs> The term vulnerabilization is also intended, again, to emphasize the non-essentialist or dynamic character of vulnerability. So it's not a fixed state. It's not an internal, natural, and immutable state. We become vulnerabilized. Um, and I'm going to pause for uh, one second and, um, and, and continue the talk um, shortly. I'm back. Sorry, this is one of the problems with uh, working from home. Okay, so we've got uh, this general description of what it is to vulnerabilize somebody. And now let's look at the dynamics of vulnerabilization. So the first thing that happens is that we subject someone to violent, discriminatory, or degrading behavior that can cause that person to adopt behaviors that increase their own vulnerability. So what are we describing here? We're describing the kind of behavior that can cause somebody already vulnerable to behave in ways that actually make them even more vulnerable. So um, a very traumatized and unhappy teen um, can have a big argument with, uh, say, with his or her parents. And if, they, if they're treated harshly in particular contexts, uh, they can be, be almost caused to, say, run away from home or uh, try and sleep rough. And of course, uh, in that way, increase their own vulnerability. So what we need to look at is this kind of dynamic nature of vulnerabilization, the way in which how um, agents of institutions 
uh, interact with particular people who are institutional uh, users, if you like, or clients or people who use the institution, um, can be made uh, can be made a lot worse off. So violent police behavior of somebody who's been arrested, for example, can make that person much more vulnerable. For example, if they are driven to try and kill themselves. The second um, point to make is that when we resist vulnerabilizing behaviors, wh when, whether that resistance is deliberate or not, such resistance incurs costs. And we've seen this, um, I think, most recently with the Black Lives Matter movement, where um, many, many people right at the same time tried to uh, call on you know, police, on, 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 on other groups, to um, be more aware of their behavior. And such resistance incurs costs. Um, these costs can be physical. Somebody could get arrested and beaten up, for example. They could be mental if somebody is, um, is facing degrading behavior or emotional. There could be practical costs, financial costs. Somebody could be fined, for example, for being a whistleblower <coughs> in an institution. So resisting vulnerabilizing behaviors, which often amounts to just trying to stand up to a bully can incur costs, whether you do it within the institution as a whistleblower, whether you do it outside the institution in the form of a, a social justice movement, for example. So um, people can be targeted and then adopt behaviors that make them even more vulnerable. And when they try to resist this vulnerabilizing behavior, they incur a cost. Now, here's an example um, quoted from the traveler movement in the UK, um, where um, the, 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 this, this person being interviewed says, he's talking about the relationship between the gypsy and traveler community and the police. There's been a lack of trust for a long time. You can't build trust instantly. The thing that will build that trust up is for the police to look inwards, to stop looking at gypsies and travelers. It's easier to look at the community and say, it's you that are slightly dysfunctional, you're not talking to us. It's not much more difficult to look at yourself and say, what is it about us that's stopping them from engaging? So this is precisely the kind of um, labeling and negative stereotyping that often happens to people who are being vulnerabilized. They can be vulnerabilized and at the same time be accused of being a difficult patient, um, a disruptive school pupil, a disruptive um, inmate in a in a prison and so on. So having this capacity for an institution like the police to look at itself and say, what is it about us that's stopping them from engaging? That's a really difficult and great task for institutions and not very many institutions are good at this sort of critical and uh, transparent self-scrutiny that's required. Okay, so now I'm going to say, um, a few more things about what we mean by opacity or institutional opacity. So there's a lot of opacity that's already built into institutions that are large because they're complex, they're difficult to navigate. There's a lot of jargon and local dialects as well as norms and modes of operating. Um, and this can really be quite profound to the extent that some institutions are just epistemically opaque to their users, but not to their agents. So um, anybody who works at a university knows that we use a lot of acronyms. How many of these acronyms are known to our students? <clears throat> How much of the um, administrative process, for example, of marking their work and getting the marks returned back to them, are they aware of? Not very much. So there is a level of epistemic opaqueness in large institutions. But that could be um, manageable, but can also become very extreme to the point that some institutions are entirely opaque to their users. So if you think about um, being hospitalized, not knowing what the decision making about your case is, not being able to call a doctor, having, say, in a COVID ward case, being uh, seeing people covered head to toe with, with PPE and not being able to even know who the person is that you're talking to. Um, so actually, in fact, the, with COVID, the, the epistemic opaqueness has really been exacerbated by, by masks. That means sometimes you don't even know who you're looking at. And of course, has made verbal communication uh, quite difficult, especially 
in wards that are very noisy or people who are hard of hearing or who are very ill and find it difficult to concentrate and follow a conversation at the best of times. So what happens is, um, I should probably say I'm, I'm, I'm really pro masks. This isn't a kind of anti-mask um, kind of veiled criticism. It's actually just a, a recognition of, of the, uh, the difficulties that can be caused uh, by particular procedures and in institutions. Maybe there's good reason for the procedures, but um, um, they do cause obstacles in, for example, communication and uh, epistemic transparency. So uh, as we often see, there are values such as transparency, inclusion being, inclusion, being welcoming, being a just institution, being trustworthy. And um, a lot of those values can be stated on their mission statement or their, their open homepage on the website. Um, but actually, the way in which institutions are run can operate against such values and result in an epistemically unjust institution. Now, um, we're not kind of uh, uh, pointing fingers at any particular institutions. I've given a, a very broad range education, health, social care, criminal justice, and so on. Because what we want to say is that institutional opacity is a general tendency within large scale and complex institutions, which be increasingly become resistant to forms of epistemic assessment and understanding. The more complex the institution, the more veiled the considerations, for example, about when to admit a patient and when not to admit them, the more difficult they are to understand, the more opaque they become to the, the user, in this case, the patient. <clears throat> now, what are the epistemic effects of institutional opacity? Opacity can erode our epistemic confidence, but by our, I mean that of the, the user, the person who is coming to the institution saying, I need help with my health, I need help with my social care, I need help with my education. Um, that opacity can erode our epistemic confidence and our capacity to enact appropriate styles of presentation and epistemic performance. Okay, so um, if, uh, if, um, if, if a person uh, wants to represent themselves in a, in, a, in a criminal case, that's of course something that they can't do on their own, they need support with that. When we will want to make a, a representation for ourselves, when we want, for example, access to particular treatment or we want access to a particular package of social care, we need to know how to speak to the agents of the institution, we need to know the ethos of the institution, we need to know the, the epistemic parameters by which we'll be judged. But of course, that can often also be opaque. So an opaque institution also often conceals the precise nature and the way in which the relevant economies of credibility operate. Who do we believe? Why do we believe them? How do we make credibility judgment, judgments when people come and ask us for things? For example, people who claim benefits or claim uh, social care um, and so on. Now, what happens is that this opacity can erode both solidarity and collective trust that we might quite naturally have in institutions like uh, in the UK, the NHS, the Nat National Health uh, System, Nat National Health Service. Uh, here's um, a few very striking examples. These are two women, Philippa Day and Jody Whiting, who uh, committed suicide <coughs> whilst um, trying to get her, um, her benefits, her uh, social care benefits. And uh, here is um, what uh, Philippa Day's sister said. She said her poor mental health meant she was not able to handle the battle with the Department for Work and Pensions for the reinstatement of her benefits. And in notes that she left after her death, that were discovered after her death, she wrote that her dealings with that department made her feel trapped and isolated from the world. This is an example for an, of an opaque institution. This is an example of a vulnerable person becoming vulnerabilized to the point of death. Now in the UK, <clears throat> between 2014 to 2020, there are at least 69 suicides and suicide attempts being linked to stopped benefits. So I'm not just talking here about um, uh, epistemic effects, although these are really significant, but when you come against an, in, in a, an opaque institution, the effects can be far broader and far more lethal. So institutions can abandon 
They can ignore, silence, harm, and even kill the very people they are entrusted to care for. Um, and again, I'm referring here to Shelley's uh, uh, statement in her paper, where she talks about how they're not caring institutions, but they're carceral institutions. And of course, um, it's not uncommon, sadly, for us to, um, the, for cases of patient neglect, for example, to be exposed. Uh, the Mid Staffordshire uh, uh, case that was uh, reviewed in the Francis report in the UK gave some profoundly distressing evidence about how patients were abandoned and ignored whilst lying on the very medical wards, hospital wards that were meant to look after them. So the effects of institutional opacity could be really lethal, not just epistemic, far beyond that. I want to close by talking a little bit about the two parallel levels that I, I was trying to um, point to uh, in the talk. One is that of uh, the institutional level, what we call institutional failings or institutional opacity, and one <clears throat> individual level of personal vices. Now, both of these levels can operate analogously to undermine and vulnerabilize particular persons and groups. <clears throat> so when I grew up, I went to school in the 1970s. Uh, there was a kid in my class and everybody knew he was stupid, quote unquote. And everybody um, thought he was just intrinsically, essentially stupid. Um, it turns out that um, this, this poor boy had um, dyslexia, never got the support he needed, um, and indeed became increasingly vulnerable, became increasingly uh, undermined and was uh, kind of really uh, punished and um, privilege, privileges were taken, his confidence was taken, to an extent his dignity was taken. Um, by both of these levels, you can talk about the personal vices of, of his teachers. They were impatient, they lacked empathy, they were callous, they were short-sighted. And there were also institutional um, opacity issues. Um, for example, uh, if any of you have ever tried to get additional support for your children at school, you know that there's a, an opaque domain of educational processes. Education law is very complex, at least in the UK. It's not really very clear how um, to access the, the very things that somebody might need for their child. So we can have both of these levels operating at the same time. There could be personal vices of individuals, agents who work at an institution, and then a higher level of institutional opacity, which is the way in which the institution itself vulnerabilizes individuals. So people can be vulnerabilized both by personal vices of individual agents of an institution and by institutional opacity, which is, um, something that happens not because of shortcomings or individual failures of individual people, but because of an institutional opacity. Now, KID, I mentioned earlier, talks about the vice clusters that attach to um, pathophobia, the kinds of negative stereotypes and, and uh, fear we feel uh, towards ill people. And he talks about the vices of aversion, banality, callousness, insensitivity and untruthfulness. Um, so there could be uh, these clusters taking place uh, of vice, viceful behavior occurring at the individual level and then also institutional opacity. And what we think is that the two combine and ramify to further vulnerabilize already vulnerable individuals. So I'll um, quickly wrap up. Uh, all lives are imperfect. All lives are prone to this vulnerability, are susceptible to affliction in the way I described earlier, but some are more so. <clears throat> now, this, of course, um, illuminates to us the possibility that moral excellence and perhaps other kinds of flourishing are possible even under conditions that are non-ideal and even with limited resources and personal capacities. So again, I want to um, do two things. I want to call for amelioration and reduction of vulnerabilization and vulnerability, but also not unnecessarily narrowing the space of flourishing. I want to say, yes, people who are vulnerable, people who have learning disabilities, mental disorder, um, are chronically ill, people who are disadvantaged uh, in terms of education or their upbringing, 
or, or people are reliant on, on social care, um, these on their own don't intrinsically entail the exclusion of such individuals from the space of flourishing, from their ability to say, I have a good life or to, to have an opportunity to flourish. Um, but this isn't a kind of rose tinted uh, view, because what I also want to hold on to is this idea that we ought to fight against vulnerabilization, to militate against it wherever possible. Now, what happens when we essentialize is we look to the vulnerabilities and deficiencies <clears throat> of individuals, for example, very old people, sick people, and so on, and that we, um, we take them as, as intrinsic properties of the person. <clears throat> and that, of course, can lead us to feel quite helpless or unable to change things. But of course, once we start seeing the vulnerability as stemming from social arrangements, from legal arrangements, from a political context, we can, of course, be much more uh, empowered by our, uh, our potential to change things. So instead of looking at um, um, vulnerabilities of deficiencies of very small children or very old people, um, we should look to the corresponding virtues, for example, the virtues that attach to old age that Seneca writes about, for example, the virtues that attach to very young children, the joyfulness, the curiosity and so on. Um, and instead of having a single negative focus on the uh, deficiencies and the vulnerabilities, we also ought to recognize and study and celebrate the virtues and successes of uh, people who are vulnerable, even if those virtues and successes are not up to the Aristotelian um, uh, uh, set of demands in his own theory of virtue. So vulnerability requires and tests virtues, and it requires us to be adaptive and creative in responding to life's contingencies. So when we face our own vulnerability or the vulnerability of others, we are provided with a really unique and exuberant opportunity to exhibit excellence, to flourish, to uh, respond well to adversity. And that, again, is a feature of vulnerability, a feature of adversity that is not often recognized. Thank you very much for listening. I think um, I've come in um, bang on the 45 minute mark. So I'm going to stop now. And just to say, uh, these are some of the uh, recent things uh, I've written and Ian has written that were the uh, sources material for the, for the talk. I'm very happy to send people PDFs if you can't find any of these and you'd like to read them. And thank you so much for listening and I look forward to the discussion. Hi everyone, um, this is Sarah again, and we are now going to take a five minute break and then reconvene for Q&A with Happy. So we'll see you back in five minutes and we're going to have a uh, timer on our screen so that you can uh, keep track of how much time you have. <laughs>